Okay, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Welcome to Lecture 3 of 5828, Foundations of Software Engineering. Uh, today I wanted to go back to this slide that I ran out of time on uh, for Lecture 2, which was to just kind of review whether you understood the difference between essential difficulties and accidental difficulties. Uh, and um, on your homeworks, I ask you to generate examples of accidental difficulties and essential difficulties. And these are the types of examples that uh, would be uh, totally relevant uh, for, the, for, for your answers to those homework questions. It's unfortunate, though, that I've claimed these four. <laughs> so in your homework assignment, you have to come up with new examples. Uh, you can't use these four. Uh, and that's because I just want to challenge yourself to just think about it and make sure you fully understand. If you fully understand the concept, then you'll be able to uh, generate an example fairly easily. All right, so let's just quiz yourself. Is this, e each one, the, the question is, is this an example of an essential difficulty or an accidental difficulty? Uh, and see if you can know the answers. The first one here is a bug in a financial system is discovered that came from a conflict in state and federal regulations on one type of transaction. Accidental. Accidental. And why would you say accidental? From the nature of the software. So. Okay. And what do you think? Similar thing. It's not inherent. I'm assuming that maybe this doesn't necessarily deal with software, but it's not inherent to the financial system. It's not necessarily something that dictates. Like, at, at a core level, it, it's not something that makes up the financial system. It's man-made. It's created by the state and federal regulations That's outside of the system. But, um, so think about this. You got a requirement from your customer, and you developed software that, that handled the type of transaction. And then you deploy the system, and it goes on. Um, and it turns out that uh, there's a bug. Someone reports a bug to you after the fact. But maybe it's of the type where they say, oh, hey, you know, this is great. This works in the state of Colorado, but this won't work at the federal level. So if you were to process this outside of this state, the feds are going to have a problem with this. So what has that done to you? What is that, how has that affected you now? Well, it's, <clears throat> I guess going back to the earlier question, I almost think it's essential because it's, complexity inherent to the nature that this software, of the problem that this software is trying to solve. Yes, that's right. So I would, I would classify this as an essential difficulty, okay? And this essential difficulty comes from complexity, and in particular, it's a form, it's the conformity form of complexity, right? So an external agent has come up with these different regulations, and now your system must conform to them, um, which causes more complexity for you, and it's something that is is coming from the fact that the problem domain is so complex, so that your initial deployment <coughs> was too simplistic and didn't take into, into account the fact <coughs> that there these multiple regulations in this transaction. It's a good segue for a question that I, I had when going over the homework, which is, could one say, though, that accidental uh, difficulties come from essential dis difficulties, that we, that we happen upon accidental yeah. difficulties through essential difficulties. Yeah. So that's interesting. I haven't really thought about the relationship, but certainly um, the fact that the person who is, is creating a technique or tool to give to you to then use in your software development project, they themselves were wrestling with essential and accidental difficulties in developing that particular technique or tool. So they're, they, you know, I said uh, last time that ac uh, uh, any technique that we use or any tool that we use will provide us some benefit but will almost always cause some difficulty, right? And so that is, that's the definition of an accidental difficulty, where we've picked a technique, we're going to use this technique, or we're going to use this framework, or we're going to use this tool. And now I've got this problem in my life because I, may, I made the choice of using that tool. There's always the chance that if I didn't like that problem, that I could switch to a different tool that does basically the same thing. And now I get new benefits, but possibly new problems. When, when you're in that situation where you've picked a tool <coughs> or a technique, even a management technique, and there's something that goes wrong because we're using that particular technique, then you're encountering an accidental difficulty. Right? So if your compiler has a bug on like this one here, so a new version of compiler generates code that crashes on 32-bit architectures the previous version did not. Right? This is an accidental difficulty using a particular compiler and for some reason, it's, it's causing me pain whenever I'm running my 
32-bit architectures. But I could go back to the old version of the compiler. Now I've switched tools, and now that bug goes away, and that accidental difficulty goes away. Could it also be argued, though, that it's an essential difficulty because it's dealing with the changeability that is inherent to software? Uh, no. So in this case, no. So there, yes. So um, the changeability um, essential difficulty is one is is about the pr so two things there. It is the fact that software is easy to change, hmm. right? And there's a huge amount of pressure for it to change, right? So if I'm in a project that has new hardware being developed and software for the hardware, you can bet that the lion's share of change requests is going to the software. So at some point, you have to you know, choose your platform and bid out and get manufacturing going on that hardware. But up to the day you ship, you could be making changes to the software. Whereas at, at that point, as you're getting closer to ship date, no one's saying, hey, wait a second, I don't like the hardware anymore. We should change the hardware, right? No one's saying that. They all know we've invested $150,000 or you know, $15 million in generating the hardware. No one's going to say, hey, go change that at such a late date. But your software isn't doing something right. You can expect that last day, hey, can you get this last change in? Right? So that's the, that's the essential difficulty of changeability. It's the pressure to change software that's just unrelenting. And we, get our, we, we ourselves, I, I didn't point you at the Fred Brooks essay, but one of the things he points out about programmers is that most programmers are optimists, even if in every other aspect of their life they're pessimists. In, uh, and and I'm, I'm just saying, you know, a person can be a pessimist, but then be a, be a programmer and suddenly be an optimist. Of course I can get that done. Oh, yeah, this, this, this project, I've done something like this in the past. It'll only take me three weeks, right? We're always, oh, yeah, I can get that one last change in. We're always just so optimistic about it. So we undermine... Um, you know, the hardware, people will say, oh, no, 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 too late for changes. This is what we've got to live with. Software is like, oh, well, I was just guessing anyway. Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll change things. And that's where the essential difficulty comes in. So this one here, what I want you to focus on is that a, a particular tool is being used, and now we have a problem because we chose that tool. That's an accidental difficulty. This one here is an essential difficulty because the problem domain is, is complex. It turned out to be com more complex than we realized. And so the initial version maybe did the same thing for state and federal of this type of transaction and didn't realize that it was going to be run in different contexts and the other regulations needed to be observed. And then actually it's even more insidious than that is that the state and the federal regulations on this type of transaction themselves conflict. So the state says do A, and, federal, and the federal says, do B. Now what do you do? Right? So that's where then you're truly wrestling with complexity because there's no answer there. That is a thing where you have to suddenly, you know, do we know any politicians? <laughs> Can they work to change this for us or clarify this? Which, who's the regulator? We have to go talk to the regulator. Would you allow this because these two things are in conflict? How do we do? And that... Of course, you know, maybe a couple conversations later, it's been clarified and solved, but not until you've actually done that work of saying, who do I talk to, who has the authority to say what, what we should be doing, and then implement that, and then realize the fact that a new regulator comes along, maybe they have a different interpretation, it could change again. Right? And that's where the complexity uh, comes in. All right, let's try this one. A program developed in two weeks using a whiz-bang new application framework is unable to handle multiple threads since the framework is not thread-safe. But maybe there's a framework out there that is thread safe. So given that new piece of information, that's accidental, that's accidental right? We've picked a framework, we've picked a tool, encountered a problem. So that's accidental. All right, and then a fickle customer submits 10 change requests per week after receiving the first usable version of a software system. This is essential. So this is, uh, and it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's again, changeability. Right, and uh, it may even go back to that XKCD that I showed in that first lecture of the person just asking for change requests. Change this, change that, change this, and not really understanding that one of those change requests might take months of work and another might take seconds of work. Um, so this is more of an essential difficulty. So a key thing to do is to understand and go back um, to all the things that I talked about here in each of these um, definitions of complexity so the fact that as we scale up software systems, 
it's not just an increase in the number of parts, but in the types of parts. Th so things get more heterogeneous as we scale up our software system. That adds a huge amount of complexity. Uh, the application domains themselves are, are complex. And when we model them in our systems, that complexity shows up in our models. It's hard for us to then abstract away some of that complexity. Um, it can also come from the fact that as we're working on our software systems, the amount of artifacts that we generate, the specifications, the design documents, the test cases, the code, all of that has to be kept in sync in some way. Now, many projects let certain documents grow stale, and they know just not to look at those documents. They're stale. They're out of date. But uh, you're still doing work on creating those documents in the first place. And then if you do try to keep them consistent, that's additional work that you're doing to keep everything consistent and not actually working on the software to bring the system to completion. So that is then a new type of complexity. Uh, the conformity is when the change that we're being asked to do or the problem that comes up is just completely arbitrary. And it's not one that you can anticipate. So, for instance, if you have a system that pr processes different types of financial uh, transactions, you might start out by saying, oh, well, we're on the, the lion's share of transactions in this domain is this type and this type. So we're going to start by creating a system that supports just those two types. Then in your design, you might say, oh, let's come up with an object-oriented design or functional design, whatever you want to do, that has a key concept of transaction. And then what we'll do is make it easy to add new types of transactions. Uh, and most of the software won't have to change as we add new subtypes, uh, uh, new types of transactions into the system. What you're doing there is planning for reasonable change. <coughs> the fact that you know that there are multiple types of transactions, it's reasonable to suggest that your customer might come at you and say, hey, you support A and B, can you also support C? And so then if you do work, good, good object-oriented design work, with encapsulation and all those nice uh, properties, you might be able to make it. So yeah, actually, our software doesn't, know anything about the transaction. All it does is it gets a transaction object, which has an interface, and it says execute, or give me information, or save on the transaction type. If all your code is written at that high level, then uh, you can add a new transaction type in minutes. Right? You just add in the new subtype to the transaction object, put all of its functionality down there in that class, subclass, add it to your system, recompile, you're, 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 you're golden. But now someone comes in and says, I also, rather than handling all these transactions, I also want a whiz-bang 3D graphics interface because I heard those are cool. Um, that is the type of change that, you know, you weren't planning on doing that. You thought you were going to be a back-end server-only thing. Text file logs is good for everybody at that stage. I don't need to do this interface. So from, that, from your perspective, there was no way for you to reasonably plan that someone would come in and ask for a graphical user interface on this, on this service. So that becomes conformity. Now you're conforming what you do, but previously it was so, it's so random, you just can't spend your time thinking about that. It's the reasonable change that you can plan for. So this, the, for conformity, it is a type of complexity. So complexity is the root of our class hierarchy here. Conformity is a type of complexity. And the key thing about it is that it's arbitrary complexity, things that we can't plan for. And then finally, changeability, I talked through earlier here. It's the, it's the fact that software is easy to change and it's pressured to change. And so we're, and we're not willing to uh, sometimes push back and say, no, we're not changing this anymore. The deadline's too close. We're sticking to our guns. We rarely do that. Um, and actually, we'll talk about that in the Agile, uh, when we talk about Agile life cycles. Agile life cycles are designed to get software engineers to be more brave about defending their deadlines. Say, hey. Two weeks ago, we were all here, all the stakeholders. We all talked through it, and here was what we agreed to. And we promised to deliver in three weeks. Uh, you can't come in now and change and pretend like the change is not going to upset things. You were in that meeting that developed those estimates. So we'll see that when we get to uh, Agile life cycles in a couple of lectures. So, uh, so that was what those things were. And then invisibility is this notion of um, software is this intangible uh, entity. So the thing that we that actually runs on the computers is really hard to see. It's just you know uh, bits on a storage medium until it's executed. Yes. Could it be almost safe to say that all the other complexities kind of derive from the fact that software is inherently invisible? <laughs> I mean, it, this is something that I was writing down in the homework. I kind of thought to myself, yeah. I was like, all these other things may not exist if software wasn't invisible. Yeah. Well, it's certainly, you know, the fact that, you know, building foundations or hardware devices are visible 
it makes them more immune to these types of pressures. That's, that is for sure. Um, it's invisibility is just a, another confounding aspect of complexity, right? It's, it's not only do we face complex application domains and complex uh, elements that consist of hundreds or thousands of parts taxing our seven plus or minus two brains um, and the fact that we're constantly being asked to change it and to boot, we can't see the damn thing. And when we try to draw it, we're only drawing one small aspect of it. So then if we're talking about two aspects, we have to draw something else. And then, well, there's three aspects. Oh, that's another thing. And as I showed here, 13 different types that three people who have thought about software design for decades came up with and said, this about covers all the different types of diagrams you might <laughs> need in a software project, right? And, and any one of these diagrams have different notations. I, I don't do it in this class, but in the object-oriented analysis and design class, we look at some of these. We look at activity diagrams, state diagrams, uh, class diagrams, object diagrams, and we talk about when you use them. I won't do that in this class. That's not really the focus uh, for, for this particular class. But they're there, and they're very different things. So if you have an activity diagram, each activity represents a suite of objects that would be instantiated in running to uh, passing messages back and forth to enable that ste step of the activity. Go to the next step in the activity, it's a whole, possibly a whole other set of objects. And so each step in the activity diagram could lead to a corresponding class diagram and sequence diagram that says, for this activity, these objects interact in this way. Right? And that's why when you go into startups or other, other places where software developers, software engineers are working, whiteboards are typically covered in all sorts of boxes and arrows diagrams. And even not erased because, oh, that could be useful. Let's you know, take a picture or something about that. But um, those are the, the conversations you're having is, yeah, we'll instantiate one of these, and then it'll invoke this message over there. Um, and then those diagrams, um, yeah, they all serve different purposes. So and then the other, the flip side, of the, uh, the other aspect of this, the, so this is just the state we're in. It's, it's not visible. It can't, we can't use our own um, kind of visual systems. Uh, easily to reason about it, um, but uh, it, yeah, so we have these different types of notations, but then um, this fact that we can't draw upon um, all the, the millions of years that have gone into our visual systems and understanding uh, visual data uh, to help us solve problems, whereas I mentioned, you know, with architecture, you can put up a 3D visualization of a house, put a kitchen island somewhere and have people that are not experts go, oh, that, that's not, not going to work there. It really should be over there. It's in the way. It would block traffic flow or whatever. Those types of things we do very intuitively, and it's very hard to bring those types of intuitions to software. So you don't have those corresponding uh, structures, uh, visual structures that, that we have out in the real world. So those are the types of essential difficulties. So now, you know, if we had... Uh, you know, an example of a, a bug that came out of the fact that um, a developer was, was uh, coding up a method based on a sequence diagram that actually got out of date with its associated activity diagram, right? So now we've got this notion of invisibility that's kind of permeating that example. You could say accidental difficulty because you could say, well, they chose UML and you're, you're dealing with problems with UML. But it really does come from this fact of not being able to keep them all in sync, right? So it's more of an essential difficulty on that. So some of these examples get a little wishy-washy. So if you come up with an example and you're not 100% clear, it's <coughs> accidental, then, then go for it in your explanation. Say, here's my example, and I can see that it's an accidental difficulty because, and I can see that it's an essential difficulty because, and pull those things out. Because there's often, you know, as Austin, your questions are showing, there could be relationships among these things. One aspect could be driving problems that appear in another aspect, and that's totally fine. Just engage with that in your answer. Kind of just describe uh, it fully through. Okay, and you'll get examples of additional ones of these on a quiz that I'll be probably standing up this weekend for running next week on these concepts just so you can reinforce uh, what we've been discussing here. And then now's a good time before I get into the Git uh, material uh, to say that I am because I've, I've, I've realized I just tried to cram too much stuff in the first couple of lectures that, you know, lecture one really should be that intro to software engineering. Lecture two is no silver bullet. So the Git material is lecture three, not 2A. I'll, I'll renumber all of this. And I'm going to push the homework assignments due date back to Tuesday of next week. So it'll be due 
week three of class next week. And I haven't updated the class website yet, but I'll do that uh, probably uh, late tonight. Okay, so that's where we're at on this. Let's switch over to what I want to talk about today, which is Git. Um, and I want to give, basically, I don't want to come in assuming that you all know Git and are comfortable with Git. I want to make sure that we all have kind of a base, a base uh, shared understanding and a shared introduction to, to the repository. I've been using Git for many, many years, and I'd say I know about, and I'm comfortable with, maybe 35% of it. 40% of it. Um, there are things that Git can do that when I find out about them, I go, what? what? You're kidding. Uh, there is a command called git bisect, which I have never had to use, but uh, it actually is one in which you're trying to figure out which commit introduced a bug in the software system. And if you have a way for git to you know, basically t a test, is the bug present or not, you can tell git to bisect. You can think, but from this commit and this commit, somewhere in between in this hierarchy chain of all the branches, etc., is the commit that introduced this bug. And then Git will do a binary search trying to find the, uh, the commit for you. And I, I've never touched that functionality, but apparently they use it in Linux all the time. Um, the other thing that they'll do, we're going to talk about uh, commits uh, today with branches where you have two branches, a uh, basically a, a branch where you've been doing some work and you want to merge it into another branch. But Git has what's called octo commits, which I've never had to do, but that's where you're bringing in more than two branches on a merge. And, and the reason why it's octo is because it, there's no upper limit, right? There, there, it's not like it could be eight branches only that come in. Any number of branches can be merged into a single commit, and Git will handle it for you. Uh, also used primarily in the Linux domain where they're pulling in contributions from literally hundreds or thousands of, of developers. So Git is designed for configuration management of really large software projects. It literally came into existence because Linus Torvalds was sick and tired of the configuration management system they were using for Linux, and it was also against his sensibilities because it was a commercial product. So he sat down and wrote Git in like a couple of weeks. And then they started using it for Linux, and then it's been evolving ever since. And it was, so it was designed for truly large-scale software systems. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about it. And there's some truly ingenious aspects of its design. I will mention a few of them, but I won't go into any detail. And I actually have a pointer to a book that does a great job of explaining a huge amount of its design uh, if you want to learn more about it. Okay, so... And we'll be learning it because I'll be asking you to do things like uh, clone this repository and when you submit your homework by doing a push request or a, what is it called, a pull request on the, on the home re repository. And so eventually I want to get you comfortable with creating repos, uploading them to GitHub, cloning them, forking them, doing pull requests, the whole uh, ecosystem. Now, we'll primarily be doing that on textual-based objects until you get to your semester project and you're working in a team. Then you'll be doing... Uh, that on so source code um, uh, within, those, within those semester projects. But for us, we'll be mostly sharing uh, uh, text with one another uh, in our essays. Not, not exclusively true, but, but mostly. Um, okay, so, so for instance, I'm going to be asking that all essays this semester be uploaded to GitHub. And that means you need to be comfortable with the following technologies, Git and GitHub and Markdown. And Markdown is kind of the de facto language. It actually turns out now they just keep adding a bunch of different languages. So if you've already learned a markup language, like restructured text or something else that you really like, most likely you can use it uh, to enter your, enter your text. But I'll be covering Markdown in particular. Um, now, what, eventually we might start creating, take the stuff that we're creating in essays and want it to appear as uh, a website of some form. So once we get to that point and we start producing HTML documents, it'll be good for you to know HTML5 and CSS. Now, that is one technology that I won't uh, go into, except when we cover, uh, when we cover um, serverless single-page web applications. There will be portions of that from talking about a particular HTML structure or what some CSS does, but it won't be a focus of mine to teach you those concepts. Those will be something you'll have to bootstrap on at the time. And then there's a framework that GitHub builds right into uh, its service that if you upload a re repository that makes use of something called Jekyll, it'll take that repository and convert it to a website. 
uh, automatically. And you can then just work with little markdown files to add posts, and it, it makes it easy to create a blog and you know, all those kinds of things. We might see that in action on a couple of examples, but again, I won't really be focusing on Jekyll this semester. The bare minimum is this, these three, Git, GitHub, and Markdown is what I want you to become comfortable with. So today we'll start with Git. On Thursday, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in GitHub and Markdown. Okay, so what is Git? It is a distributed version control system that now most people call configuration management system. Um, but it came from a line of research in the software engineering community called version control systems. Uh, and old version control systems uh, are things like RCS. That's a really SVN. old one. What? SVN. SVN, subversion. Um, and uh, let me see what you call it. Clear case is another one. EFS. Ant. Uh, what? Ant. Not one of them. No. Uh, maybe, it could be. I just uh, I don't recognize it. Ant. Ant. Oh, no. Ant is a deployment tool. Perforce. Uh, what? Perforce. Par, yeah, par, par force. Uh, so there, there's a bunch. There's a bunch out there, um, and the basic idea is to keep track of. Uh, if we say I just deployed version 2.3.6 of my software system, that there's some tool I can go to that says what files were in 2.3.6, and then I need to jump back real quickly to version 1.2, and I need to see the system as it was in 1.2. And then I need to jump forward to 1.7, then take those two things I just found and bring them into 2.3.5. Right, so a version control system lets you be completely confident in working with the complete history of your software system. It was developed by the Linux community in 2005 to help manage the development of Linux itself. So it needs to solve problems of how to do version control with software systems consisting of tens of thousands of files, hundreds of thousands of developers all working on the project at once. Now, what's funny is that uh, if, you were to, if you were to teleport back in time to when I was using RCS on really old uh, Unix systems and given me this sentence, my, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed that it was possible to do something like this. So Git was truly amazing uh, in, what it, in what it did. And in the research community, they talk about the different models of collaboration and other sorts of things that these systems support. Now, for Mac OS X, which is the, thing, the platform that I'm most familiar with, if you have something called Homebrew, which is located at this URL, to install Git, you just type brew install Git, and it will be installed in user local bin and be available. If, it's no, if, you don't, if you're not on OS X, then go to this website, which is Git's official website, and you can download an installer for your platform. It typically ends up, at least on Unix-based platforms, in user local bin, or user bin, but ho hopefully user local bin, so you have a separate from your, the one that came with your system, your operating system. But there are versions for Windows, there are versions for pretty much every platform. Um, so, what is version control? Let's go back to that, the basics here. A version control system is just keeping track of changes made to the files that make up a software system. And initially, this was just applied to files individually. So there wasn't this notion of the whole system, it was just here's this one file, and here's version one of the file, and here's version two, and version three. You will see this and probably have used things like this in Microsoft Word when you turn track changes on. And there it's saying, okay, starting at point zero, when I turned track changes on, show me every change that I've made since then. Now, it's not a complete analogy because Word has no way of saying, okay, call these changes version one. Now clear it out again, and let's start doing track changes again. So it doesn't have that notion in, inside of Word, but it's similar to that. So for instance, with a file, you could say a Java file starts with some initial content, say a class, and you check that in, and that becomes version zero of your file. You then add a method to the class using your favorite editor, and you check that change in, that becomes version one. And the key thing here is check that change in, right? So at some point, you turn to, the repo to your, your uh, configuration management system and you say, okay, I'm good, save this. And that's, in most systems, they call that checking in. In, in Git, they call it commit. Uh, now, most version control systems handle tracking the versions of files automatically. Right? So when you're in Git, you'll never think about, or you shouldn't have to think about, oh, what was the version of this file? Uh, it turns out Git is just keeping track of that automatically for you. And then when you deal with the thing called commit, it's not on a single file, it's on sets of files. 
And in, and in particular, it's on every single file that's in your program. And that includes binary files, that includes uh, textual documentation and the source code itself. And oddly enough, implicitly the directory structure, but it doesn't actually uh, do any actions on directories. Directories are just <coughs> names that happen to be places where files appear to get. You can't do something like create an empty directory and commit it. Uh, Git won't see the point. There's no file inside that directory, so why should I include that directory? There are ways around that, little command flags, but then you start to get off the beaten path and people can start getting things where those directories are appearing on one person's machine and pruned away automatically on another person's machine and then confusion reigns. Um, so, uh, what we want to do then is talk about changing sets of files. So when you change the concept of version to sets of files, then you want to think about your project might start with one source code file and a build script, uh, might have some images stored in some subdirectory, and you check that in and that's version zero. It's the whole thing. All of those images plus the build script plus the source code file, in that configuration, that is version zero. You then add a second file, rename the original file, and modify the build script. <coughs> Check those changes in, that's version one, right? So in, in, in place of an individual change to a file, you're keeping track of all those files. So if this is version zero, we might have, you know, proj directory, and in here have readme.md and um, main.java and a license file, like that. And so if I say to get, uh, add all of this stuff and commit it, that's version zero, this whole thing. And then if I say, oh, main.java is silly, I want that to be foo.java, so rename foo.java, delete license, I'm not ready to commit to one yet, um, and update readme, you know, maybe its file size went from, you know, 10 bytes to uh, 150 bytes, whatever it is. Now I check that in, again, we're in the proj directory, this becomes version one. And what Git does when you check in the second version is it points back and it says, my parent commit was zero. And this is a key thing to understand about commit. Anytime you create a commit, that current commit is pointing back at its parent. If you're at commit zero and say, what's my child commit? There's actually no operation that does that. It doesn't keep track of the child commits. Git does by following version trees back. It keeps, it keeps track of all the tips of the branch and then it can work its way back to the root. But it doesn't, it, it mimics if you say, hey, what comes after zero? It'll tell you, but it doesn't figure it out by following a link that was stored up here at zero. All the links point back. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you can have this go on. You can create commits. 423 that are on different branches. We'll get to that in just a minute. And they could all be pointing back to one and then to zero. Um, and then you, as I mentioned, these octo commits, you know, this is just creating branch, creating branches. An octo commit might come in and say, okay, time to merge 423 into five. Okay? So what we're building up over here is a version structure that says, I got to version one, which had this, I no longer had a license file, had foo.java, and it had more t stuff in the readme. Over here, I might be adding other .java files. Over here, I might be trying out a different version of the readme. Over here, I might be uh, putting the license file back in. And I'm using each of these branches to isolate what task I'm working on. Only modifying source code in this branch. Only thinking about the license in this branch, etc. And then when I'm satisfied with my work, and I haven't shown this, but of course there could be a six and a seven, and that's when that got brought in, so that, that this isn't there. There can be multiple steps on these branches. Eventually we bring it all in, and Git's gonna say, what's the merge of all of these things? And put that in version five, so that it now contains, in my example, a new license file, more Java files, an updated readme file, all in version five. So that's the basis 
of what version control systems do. And then what's great about this is that at any point, I could say to Git, go, take me back to version zero. One command, boom, you're back to this. And then you say, okay, I'm done, boom, back to five. Right? And you have just incredible freedom as a developer now. Like I, like you would probably, if you weren't comfortable with, with the version control systems, when I was creating the um, repo for this class, I first created the repo that had the syllabus and the markdown file and a couple other things, and then I realized in order for this one image to display in, in uh, the no silver bullet file, I needed to have a, a file out on the web that I could point to. And so uh, GitHub allows you to do that on a different branch. You can create a new branch, uh, call it GH Pages. We'll get into this on Thursday. But you create a new branch called GH Pages, and you have a new commit down here. And what I did here after I created the branch is I deleted everything. And then I created an images directory and stuck my image in that directory <coughs> and committed it. And so all the files that are on this branch don't even appear over here on this branch. And I could delete it knowing that I could at any point could jump back to the other branch and all the files would come back. So it gives you a huge amount of confidence as a developer to try new things because you're basically creating backups. Uh, backups that you can jump to and know that they're going to reliably be there. Okay, so let's, uh, I've got some review material here. I kind of jumped ahead, but it was, it was you know, good to have that flow there. So here's versions form a line called a branch. Uh, repo created with one Java source file and a build script is zero. Add a new Java file, rename, build script updated, version one. Three new Java files added. Resource directory created with three images. Two previous Java files updated, two. So the important thing here is to realize a bunch of changes can happen in each commit. Um, so now lines are called branches because that's what they do. Uh, they branch. And a typical scenario might be you're, you created the project, got version one, added a new method here, and then you realize there was a bug way back in version zero. And uh, people are using version two right now, so you want to deal with this bug uh, on a different branch, allow them to continue working on that, and you fix the bug in some other branch. So here you say bug discovered, you create a bug branch, a bug fix branch, and then once you've made some changes to that branch, you commit, and that gets you your first commit on this new branch. And that was your first attempt to fix it, which didn't work. So you do some more changes, and finally the bug is fixed. That's in version four. Meanwhile, nothing's happened up here. People are still using version two. Everything's hunky-dory. They're complaining about the bug. You can finally say, I want to merge this bug fix that I tested over here into the main branch. And then uh, now the bug fix is merged. And then you could release a new version of the software system, which has the fix deployed. And then development continues. Um, now this main branch here is called master, and that's completely a convention. You can call it anything you want. You can, you can name your, first thing you can do in a Git repo if you wanted to is uh, create a new branch, add some commits to it, switch back to master and delete master if you want to do that. People get really confused. The convention is so <laughs> common that there's a master branch that you'd be you know, going down the, uh, the, the wrong path there, but you could. The, the names don't mean anything, and this is a little joke that I put in there for gamers. I won't even talk about it. <laughs> um, so two key features of Git. Git has two key features that enabled its success. One is that branches are quick and cheap to create. So if you have a thousand branches in uh, your Git repo, Git doesn't care. And in fact, the size of your repo, if you create 2,000, 10,000 branches, grows up very tiny. It's just a small piece of metadata. And really, if you want to think about it, um, actually, I'll do it on the next slide. Um, the reason for this is that branches are just pointers. You have in your database a set of commits. Branches are just pointers that say, this name, master, points to this commit. That's it. Then if you go from the name to that commit, you know that's the head of that branch. And then you can say, what was your previous commit? What was your previous commit? What was your previous commit, right? And every branch is named. So this was not true of other version control systems. So subversion is one in which a branch operation is a, is a heavyweight operation, should only be done sparingly, because it actually takes 
If I remember right, I could be wrong on this, but it takes a bunch of objects that were true, that were contained in this branch, and creates exact duplicates, like copies, a whole bunch of those objects into a new thing, which a new heavyweight construct called the branch, and then merges are painful, like it would get things wrong, or um, it would run out of memory sometimes on doing these things, and it would fall over. So in subversion, there's a culture of not branching. <coughs> Because you run into problems down later on with, the, with trying to merge. With Git, they're like, no, no, that's what I do all the time. I get a new version of Linux, I create a new branch, I add my new favorite feature, and I submit it and hope that Linus will accept it into, or whoever will accept it into the operating system. So they wanted to say branch early, branch off. And that's because when it comes time to merge, like I did over there with number five, almost always it merges with no conflict. Like, it can just figure it out. Okay, this one file went away, that one was renamed, these three new methods were added, merge it all in, done. It's only, uh, the only time that you have to watch out for, and this is, you know, on a very large project, the, the increase, the, the probability that a conflict is going to occur goes way up. In most medium-sized projects and small projects, people are working on different areas, and conflicts rarely occur. Now, that, that being said, they could they could uh, check in changes that don't conflict in the terms of the locations that they were at, but they could easily include semantic errors. So it doesn't mean that the system is bug free, there just wasn't any conflict with the changes. Um, so if there's a conflict, however, if I changed one line in this, in this file in my branch and you change the same line in that same file in your branch, when we merge, Git's gonna go, I don't know which one of these lines should become the, the winner. Uh, and that it just gives to the human. It'll say, hey, here's this file. It does some funny formatting. I'll show that to you in a minute. Uh, which of these two lines should be included? And that's why that's, that conflict resolution uh, strategy is called last developer wins. <laughs> because the last developer who checks in their changes and sees the conflict goes to say, should I accept my changes or should I accept Joe's changes? Hmm. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's a whole other issue. Um, okay, so that means to master Git, you really need to become familiar and comfortable with branches and all their associated operations. And our next homework will ask you to do just that so that you'll get comfortable switching between branches. Okay, so now, a couple of other things that uh, enabled Git's uh, success is that in other version control systems, like in Subversion, they assume that there is a master repository somewhere, that's the official repository, and then when you create a local copy on your machine, it is a client repository that is not the same as the official repository. So you have this kind of shallow copy and you work on it and then you submit your changes to the master copy and then the master copy, everyone else gets notified or eventually figures out there's a new version on the master, they have to pull those changes into their client copies and go from there. Git does not have that and doesn't care about it, thinks it's weird. With Git, every copy of the repository is official. You have the complete contents of the repository as it was when you cloned it. Um, and then later on, you can start to copy things in from other, other versions of the repository. Um, and and uh, it, can, it then continues to be your official repository. And that is that there's no one repository that's blessed in any way. Okay? And it gets very confusing. It gets confusing to the point that GitHub is all about adding a notion of a master repository for everyone to sync around. Right? So we put a copy of the repository up on, on GitHub, and then we have all these processes that allow changes to merge in, and then we copy and update our copies of the repo, and then um, we continue on with that, with, with that style of development. But that's just a convention. We're all just agreeing that GitHub is the repo that we should uh, all uh, copy and centralize around. It's just a convention. If we wanted to, uh, you could take your copy, not GitHub's copy, but your copy, put it up on the web, add GitHub's web service interface in front of your repo, and tell people yours, your copy should be the master copy that we all centralize around. It really is just a convention. So every copy has the complete contents of the repo when it's first created. Contents can drift, of course, as people work on it in different copies, but then easily synchronized. Uh, and then how a group synchronizes their repository is left up to them, and that's where the convention comes in. A lot of people use GitHub by default, but that is just a convention. It's just a choice. 
Um, and there's a huge range of workflows that are out there that can support the work of one developer, five developers, even thousands of them. So on the official Git website, they talk about some of these workflows. And you can see that they really can be quite different from organization to organization. OK, so some more key concepts to understand uh, with Git is that we can talk about things being in the index or being staged. We can talk about our working directory, and we can talk about the repository. And the basic transitions between them is that I'm working in a directory with some files. I'm using my editor or my IDE to manipulate the contents of, that, of those directories and uh, the contents of the files in that directory. And then at some point, I say, OK, I'm ready to save this work as a commit. So what I do is I say, take my changes and add them to the index. Or to the, and, and when you do that, um, Git talks about it and people talk about it as those changes are staged uh, for a commit. And then when you finally have everything that you want to go into the commit staged, you finally say git commit, and that's when all the changes actually go into the repository become permanent. You get one of these version numbers and your working directory, you, you stage all the changes, you commit it, and your working directory gets updated to match what you just did. Now normally your working directory doesn't change because you just, you just committed what your working directory was in, but there can be some differences. Now what's interesting about the staging area is that sometimes developers really advanced ones, the ones that are, are very comfortable with Git, will work on some changes in a file and stage them, go to some other file, do a couple changes, stage one of them, go into another file, make a bunch of changes, and then stage like two of those. And that's because <coughs> the five changes in that one file, the two, the one in the second one, and the two in the third are all about the same thing. The other changes that they made are, one, are about something else, and they're just choosing to keep those in the working directory, stage everything else, and commit it. So you'll see there are graphical user interfaces to Git where they're integrated into source code editors where you have a change staged, and with a simple click, you can make it staged or unstaged. It'll move it back and forth. And you can go through and let's see all your changes and say, yep, stage this one, stage that one, stage that one, because it was all had to do with you know, update new transaction. So and you just commit update new transaction, but you might still have other changes. You stage those and you commit them. Um, so what I'm going to show you is really kind of the most coarse grain behavior of Git, where every change that you make, you stage, and then you, you commit all of them. But know that there's more uh, flexibility in Git than that. And then so there's two ways to go from the repository to a working directory. One is to, uh, of course, if you clone a directory initially, you'll get the copy of it as it was, and your working directory will be set to the head branch that the, that the, um, of the master branch, typically. Um, but you can go to the repository, and you can say, git checkout. So you could be down at 5 and say, git checkout 0. And if you, get, if you do git checkout 0, then git is going to rewrite your working directory to match what it was supposed to look like at stage 0. So the git command is in here, rewriting things either over here, over here, or over there. One interesting thing that I learned today, actually, so I, was, I was had a question about it, so I wanted to look it up, was you can take a file and add it to the index, and then not commit it, maybe forget that you had staged it, and then go back to your working directory and change it again. And now if you say git add again, git's fine. It says, OK, new version, no problem. New version of the file, in this case. Now that one's staged. Um, and the question I had was, could you go back to the previous uh, version of the file that you had, you had staged but hadn't committed, and then staged something on top of it? And it turns out with git, the answer, it's not straightforward, but the answer is yes, you can. Uh, what's happening when you do a git add, is the repository's database of file objects is being updated. So you say git add foo.java, it's actually copying this, this thing uh, they call it the database of the file object, and it has a name for it and, it, and the index is pointing at it. And so then if you, for that same file, add another one, which is basically you make some more changes and add it to the index again, it creates a new file object and changes the index to point at that file object. The old one is still in the database and will sit there, but nothing's pointing at it. 
and eventually get figures out that this is a dangling object is what it's called, and it will garbage collect it after a while. It'll just go away if you say git prune or other things. Um, but it is there, and there is a way, other command line options where you can go searching for it and pull it back out. So git does actually save lots of different things. So, th so just in, for now, think of working directory, the index, and the repository. All right, so now branches are just pointers. So head, master, and bug fix are, let's just, for, this, for sake of argument, are variables, right? And so we can say, what is the variable pointing at, right? So we have a branch called bug fix. Its value is the commit that is at the end of the bug fix branch. When I did a merge into master up here, Bug fix doesn't point at five, it points at four. The last thing on the bug fix branch is four, which means I could return to it at a later date and add new things to bug fix if I wanted to. All we're doing then is creating a new commit and having bug fix point to the new commit. And that's why branches are so cheap. They just are pointers that say, I am, my name is head and I'm pointing at six. My name is master, I'm pointing at six. So this diagram shows a situation in which the user has checked out the master branch that's because head is pointing at master, um, and the bug fix branch points at its last commit, and both head and master happen to be pointing at the same thing. Um, if I check out a specific commit, if I say get check out commit two, then head moves to two here, because this is where I'm currently at. My working directory would be updated to match whatever the state of the project was at two. But master doesn't change, because master is telling us where the last commit to master is. And the same with bug fix, it doesn't change as well. And then now normally when I jump back in time like this, what I'm, gonna, what I'm about to do is create a new branch and then I'll start making commits and that commit will then branch out with two as its parent and will continue on. And then eventually I'd have to go and merge that back into master at some point. You also wouldn't have a name, right? Like if you tried to, if you switched back to master and then tried to switch back to that branch, you hadn't. You, no, you would have to create a name. When you create the branch, you create, you, you say, okay, hey, create branch, and now it's called foo. And so then foo would point at two. Um, until, and then you, the first thing you would need to do is create a new, you'd make some changes, create a new commit, and then foo would be updated to that new commit. And we'll, we'll see this in action, because what we're going to do, I'll switch to the command line in a second, and we're going to create this graph, this one. Um, okay, so, so to create a new git repository, the command is git init. And so here's where you'll need to just become uh, comfortable with the command line. So let's go to the desktop right now. Okay, uh, we're going to make a directory, we'll call it uh, test repo. We'll go into test repo. Right now, it's not a git repository. It is completely empty. It just has its pointers to the current directory and the parent directory. But if I say git init, then I've initialized an empty git repository in users kenna desktop test repo dot git. Okay? And a handy Unix command, not installed by default, but I install it almost within three seconds after any new machine that I get, is called tree. Oh, I actually... I need to tell it to show me invisible directories. Uh, is that A? Yeah. So tree-A. And this shows what git created when I did git init. So in this directory, there's now a new invisible directory called .git. And inside of here is everything that git needs to do its functionality. What this means is don't ever go into .git and change anything. Don't, just stay away from that directory. Don't do anything. Head here is actually a literal pointer to the current commit, right? Uh, and then it's got all sorts of things, hooks, uh, little sample text messages, um, uh, some exclude, uh, basic exclude information. Here's objects is the database I talked about. Um, and refs are uh, the heads of branches and the tags that we've put into the data, uh, into the re repository. I won't talk about that. But when we, when, we, when we talk about branch names, we're actually talking about refs. And the refs of a repository are basically the branches that we have and ways to refer to the various branches and commits. <coughs> All right, so even though in my, if I just do an ls in this directory, it says I don't have anything. As you can see, git created a bunch of stuff. 
Um, what's nice about this design, of course, on Unix systems is that I can now tar this directory up, I can create <coughs> an archive, I can send it to someone, and the, all the information about the repository goes with the archive. It's all self-contained in the same directory. Okay, so now, um, if you have a set of cha changes stage, you can commit them to the repository with the command git commit, and the editor will open that. You can type the log message. So let's do, let's do something to show that. So, and actually, do I talk about it on the next one? Oh, this is just my overview. I bet you down here. Yeah, okay. I, I'm about to step through an example. I'm oh, sorry. I got through. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so let's talk just a little bit about this real quick. Um, so to create a new Git repository, do git init. Um, if you've got a set of changes staged, you commit them with git commit. The editor will open. You can type the log message. We'll, get, we'll show you that. If you want to know what the current status of your repo is, you type git status, and it will show you uh, what changes have been currently staged, whether everything is hunky-dory or if you have problems. Uh, and this will show what branch you are on. Yeah, okay, so if you've modified a file or a new directory that you want to stage, uh, to stage it, you say git add and you give it the name. Um, if you want to get rid of a file, you say git remove, file or dir name. And if you want to rename a file or directory, you say git move, old file or dir name, to new file or dir name. And again, directories are being handled in a weird way by git. Yes? Um, is there a difference between git move and just move? Is it that git would remember that they had been the same file? Exactly. Okay. Yes, so if you have a file in your in your uh, directory in in Linux or Unix, the way you rename the file is you say move uh, main.java to foo.java, right? So now in this in this case, if I typed mv uh, you know main.java foo.java, it would rename the file. But now when you type git status, git status would say, hey, the main.java file is gone. I don't know where it is, and there's this new file foo.java that I've never heard of before. But if you type git mv and then do the same thing, then it will show and say this file's been updated. It used to be called this. Now it'll be called, now it'll be called that. If I recall correctly, git doesn't like to delete things unless you force it to. Isn't that like a part of the git commit? Like no, you can do this one here, git rm. And that's what I was just going to ask. I was going to ask if this specifically removes that. It because does. if you do it, you know, just within uh, the UI, or you do it within the command bar or yeah. command line with just remove, I think it, you have to like actually specify to it and tell yes. it remove and what, files. Exactly. What happens is if you come in and you make changes uh, that undermine Git's view of the world. So I come in and remove a, remove a file. When I type Git status. Its data structure says, hey, there was this file here, and it's not there anymore. That's all it can say. It doesn't know how it went away. <laughs> Whereas if you tell Git, go ahead and remove this file, it actually can update its database, update its view of the world, and I think it actually, I have to go to test this, but I think it actually just auto-commits that change so that it's just like ready to, you know, ready to go, or at least stages it for you automatically. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, but yeah, you want to use these commands when you're making these changes so that Git can keep track of everything that's going on. Um, now to see the current set of branches in your repo, you just type git branch. <coughs> if you want to create a new branch, you check it out while supplying dash b. So these are, you know, Unix command line uh, uh, interfaces. They're not the most intuitive of things. But here you're saying uh, dash b says, here's my new branch name, both create it and check out to it. Uh, check it out so it becomes the new current branch. If you already have existing branches, you can just say git checkout and a branch name, and it will switch to it. And since you're switching possibly from one part of the, of the commit tree to a completely different part, it updates the working directory to match when you do that checkout. When you want to, uh, as we'll see on Thursday, when we have a repo that's also on GitHub, or any other repo, really, uh, that is accessible via the Internet, you can push commits to it. Uh, to say, hey, I've, got a, I've, I've made a bunch of changes to my repository. Go copy all those changes and put them in this other repository. And the same thing, if that other repository is updated and I want those changes, I can say git pull to get those into my local copy. All right, so we're going to step through the simple example that recreates that graph on slide 13. Now, what I have, I've been giving you these version numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is just a <coughs> fiction. That's just a falsehood. I've been lying to you. You never get version numbers that look like that. You instead look, get version numbers that look like that. 
these hashes um, that are uh, allow Git to uniquely identify files and commits. And it's the use of these hashes, actually, that allow Git to do really cool things. So, for instance, if you have a file and you add a method to it, you're at one hash. It'll be one version, and it'll be one of these hashes. If you then delete that method um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, so you have you had a file before which didn't have the method. If you then added the method, you get this new hash. It had a previous hash. And then your next change is to delete the method so that it goes completely back to what it was before. When you commit that change, the commit branch updates, but Git realizes that it's exactly the same as this previous file that's in its database, and it uses that one. It doesn't create a new copy. So, and the way it does that is through hashes. The file will hash to the same hash if it has the exact same content. And so then it's a database lookup. Do you have a file that has this hash? Yes, I do. Okay, I won't create it again. And so you can get huge scalability. You might be going in and out with, you know, some serpentine route that keeps hitting the same file because you made some changes and reverted them and made some changes and reverted them. And it remembers that path so that it can recreate the history for you exactly. It just doesn't keep creating new copies of that same file. Would it like a white space change cause a complete, completely different A white hash? space change would, in fact, create a new hash. Yep. Um, okay, and this is, that's one of the aspects. These hashes make a lot of things in Git possible. Uh, I don't have time to cover it, but this version control with Git second edition, even though it's many years old now, four years old, is a really good introduction to Git if you want to... Uh, uh, learn more about it. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and do the <coughs> So we create this new directory, I create a test repo, here we say example project. Uh, we're going to go to readme and, and add some uh, text to it. So we'll do this. Oh, it's a, it's a screenshot, so I'll have to do it myself. So vi readme.md, and we'll just say test, and this is a test readme file. Okay. So we're here in our, our repo. We just have that one file, readme.md. Um, and if I do a git status, git status will say a couple of things. It'll say that we're on the master branch, so it automatically created the master branch. We're in the initial commit, which is what I called zero over there. And we have some untracked files, which means that in our directory is a file I know nothing about, readme.md. It's just appeared magically. It's there. I'm just letting you know about it, right? Uh, and nothing has been added to the commit, but there are untracked files present, so use git add to track. This line, this very helpful line, didn't used to be there. But eventually the developers said, oh, well, maybe we should help out newbies. Uh, we'll add some additional information here, which tells you if this file is untracked and you want it to be in the repo, use git add. So they start to do some self-documentation here. So let me see what my thing says here. So we're going to... Uh, save it. Oh, I see. I created this before doing git init. Anyway, I did that out of order. Sorry about that. Um, so we've created a repository, but we haven't committed anything to it. We have one file in our working directory that git knows nothing about. It refers to that file as being untracked. So now what we're going to do is tell git to track this file. So that's when we say git add readme.md. And it's git is a very uh, uh, non-chatty program, so you have to add flags to get it to tell you what it's doing, so it just returns to the prompt. Um, and so now we can say git status to see what's happened. And here we can say we're still on the initial commit. There are changes to be committed. There's a new file. We're going to add a new file to the repo called readme.md. And then note, this is really helpful. If I didn't want to add this file to the commit, it's telling me to uh, unstage this change, we can use git rm dash dash cached. The cached here is, is telling it that it's living in the index. And let's take it out of the index. Okay. So we're not going to do that just yet. We're going to keep readme in this commit. Um, so now uh, we're going to commit that file. So we're going to say git commit oops, dash m. If I, if I do it this way, initial commit, then I'm telling the dash m file says, here's my log. Just use this as the log message. If I didn't use this, and let me just copy this so I can do it quickly. If I didn't do this, 
when I say git commit, it brings up this editor and it says type the log message. Tell me what this commit is about. <coughs> then I say paste initial commit. And I can say, if I wanted to, eh, I can say uh, added a readme file. So now I've got a, a, this is called the subject of the commit. The first line of the file is called the subject of the commit. Everything else is the body of the commit. And you can put all sorts of information in the body. And where this is used, for instance, in GitHub, when it's displaying a commit on one line, it shows the subject. It doesn't show the body. But you can ask for full information about the commit and get the subject and body. If you do a dash M, your commit message is just the subject. It doesn't create a body in that case. So there's just some, some, some little things here. And then everything down here has a little hashtag at the front, which says the Git will, will just ignore this. It's just a place for it to put documentation for you to see as you're typing the log message. So now we exit out of VI, um, and we see the following um, down here at the bottom here. So it says we're creating a master commit, um, it's actually the root commit in this case, the very first one. Uh, its subject was called initial commit. One file changed, and three things got inserted into the database. And then this last line, I, I think, is just for Linus to understand. Yes? So if I staged the readme MD file, and then I went into it and made a few more changes, would, I, would it automatically track those changes if I try to commit it, or would it no. Uh, to like restage it? No, exactly. So you have to restage it. Yes. And so that's what I was talking about a, just a little bit earlier, where you, you, you make, make a file, make some changes, and you add, you say git add, and then you change that file again, and you say git add again. It does, in fact, create a new version of that file sure. in the index. The, ex the previous version is there, but no longer, nothing points at it. And so it'll become garbage collected later on. OK, so there we are on that. Um, now, if I say git status, so beforehand it said, hey, we have this new file uh, to check in. Now, if I say git status, let me clear this so we can just see it, git status. Now it says, on branch master, nothing to commit, working tree clean. So there's the working directory matches the commit that's at the head of the branch. So we're good. Nothing's changed. OK? So now um, we can do a git log. And this shows us that there's one commit. It's got this hash. There's the hash for it. Now this, just, just to be clear, when you have a file, it will have a hash, you know, eight, seven, three, four, dot, 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 dot. But the commit itself has a hash. Okay? So the commit is, there's, a, there's this commit which has this hash, and that hash points to three things in the database known as the tree, which ha each itself, each of these files then have a hash as well. So as I was saying earlier, we track changes to files, and we also track the changes to the commit. All right, and we can see our log message and its body when we do our git log. Um, okay, and git log, I say down here, is infinitely customizable. I kid you not. The, if you type man git and <coughs> scroll down to the git log section, it really, it just goes on for pages. You can make it do unbelievable things, actually. All right, git show shows info on the most recent commit. And the difference between the two here is that it's actually showing you the contents of the file down here. So down here at the end of git show, it's showing that, yeah, this particular, so when I say git show, it shows me the most recent commit, who the author was, what time it was, what the log message was, and then here it's saying what was the changes to, now it refers to A and B, and if you know how diff works in Unix, the diff command says, show me how the old version changed to the new version, right? So if I flip this around and said B to A, then I'd be saying, show me how the new version would go back to the old version. But right now we're saying old version, new version. And this A and B just really are placeholders to mean previous version and next version. And so then this is standard diff output that says we started with dev slash null, an empty file. Right? And now it's a file that has this three lines that we added to it. So there's a huge amount of information that's available from this stuff. It'll show you the exact changes to files in diff format, which can then be used to generate a patch, which you could then apply to some unmodified version of the source code. 
So there's a lot of cool stuff that's hiding in there. Okay. Now we're going to create two more commits on the master branch. I'm going to edit readme.md to contain a new line called first edit. I'm going to save it, git add, git commit, and then I'm going to do it again, do another edit, and save it and, uh, with git add, git commit. So if I go here, let's do this real quick. Once again, I need like I need three hours per lecture. Is that okay <laughs> with you guys? No. Um, okay. So we say vi readme. We're going to say first edit, save. I'm going to say git add readme and git commit. And this time I will use the M flag to say second or er, edit like that. And then we'll say vi readme again. Come down here and say second edit. And we'll say git add readme. So I've got to stage it again, git commit dash M. And this time I'm going to say, thir oh, I should have said third commit. Okay. There we go. So now let's look at that. Um, get up and let's close that one and tell it to open. Yeah, open a Git repository. It was on my desktop called test repo and open. Okay. And here, GitUp is a visualization tool that shows you that can visualize Git commit histories. And here's our little repo. We've got our initial commit. We have our first commit. And here it says, remember that log edit said second edit, uh, has the author and the date. And then head is pointing to our third commit. So head is superimposed on the circle for the third commit. And there, this all is happening on the master branch. Now, if you have OS 10, I highly recommend GitUp as a way to visualize your repo histories. It's super fast. It can be applied to Linux if you wanted to the, and show you really thousands of branches and thousands of commits. Um, but it's a, it's a great visualization tool, and I'll just be showing it here on the slides um, as we move forward. So that's our version tree so far. And if you recall, we're going to try to recreate um, slide 13. So we've just created 0, 1, and 2. Okay? That's what we've done so far. So that means we need to go back to 0 and create 3. Okay. So to do that... Um, so, yeah, that's where I said we're called that we're going to do this. So now, okay, to create a branch, we're going to create a branch off the very first commit. So we need to jump back to it. And to do that, we need to use the checkout command. And we have to find out what hash that first commit was. So to find out what hash that is, we say git log and look for this initial commit down here. And we're going to select this and copy it. And now I'm going to say git checkout and paste. Okay. So I hit return, and now this is, I'm in this weird state called the detached head state, which means that the head is no longer pointing at the end of the master branch. This can be very confusing if you don't understand the graphical view of what we're doing, and so Git tries to throw bunches of documentation at you to try to help you with what's going on. So ignore that for right now, but it actually does suggest the right thing, which is you're jumping back to some place most likely because you want to create a branch and start adding new commits, which is exactly what we want to do. So we are, head is now back at initial commit. Now, if we look at our working directory, we still have just the readme file. But if I go into the readme file, we're back to our initial content. The second edit, third edit, that text is gone. If I say git checkout master, I go back to the head. If I look at readme, there's our edits. It's back. It's changing the working directory every time I do the, do the checkout. So git checkout, paste in this, oops, <laughs> I lost my hash. Control C, git log, get that one again, copy, git checkout, paste. So now I'm back there where I want to be. And so now I'm going to say, and here uh, git up actually is responding, so it shows the head now down at the initial branch because we've, we've, we've checked out that uh, initial branch. So now what I'm going to do here is... Uh, create the bug fix branch. So I'm going to say git checkout dash b bug fix. So git checkout dash b bug fix. Like that. So we've switched to a new branch, bug fix. And over here, GitUp is showing us that we've created a new branch called bug fix. It has a head, and head is pointing at commit zero right now. And then we also have the master branch. And that's its current branch. That's the head of its current branch. But we're, we've switched where we're working at now, and we're over here pointing at that branch. So now, if I go in and make a change, 
And over here on the slides, I'm going to say, we're going to, we're going to edit README to say third edit, fourth edit, and save each commit each time. So, go to README, and now I'm going to say here third edit, save it, get add, and get commit. And this time I want to call it fourth commit. And I'm going to do that VI README again. Fourth edit, is that right? Yes. And do our get add and do our get commit. But this time call it our fifth commit. Okay. So over here in, in our visualization, sure enough. Now, somewhat confusingly, GitHub switched our branches. So now the master is the yellow one. We've switched over here to bug fix. These are our original commits. We came back, and this was the third edit. That was the fourth. Edit. Okay. Yes. Uh, the head pointer is it local to the user getting used? Yes. So in this case, it's where am I currently on the branch uh, in the repository? What's my working directory pointing at? Okay. So my working directory is pointing at the head of the bug fix branch. So uh, if I don't know if there are like 10 branch branches, yep. and if I don't know which one I'm pointing to, uh, yep. how do I look at that? You can say, uh, I believe you can just, uh, I think it just shows up and get status. So it says I'm on branch bug fix. That's one way. There's another way, I think it's something like get show head, which will then show you which commit you're actually pointed at. Right, so I'm on this branch here, get B, B71AB, that, that hash, and that shows a little bit more information. Okay, I'm out of time, and we'll start up on Thursday.